at the start of this year, we really sense the Spirit of God moving. And it's so important that not only we welcome the Holy Spirit, we really want the Spirit of God to do only what He can do. You say, Pastor, what can the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit can do anything. Clarity, wisdom, comfort, guidance. Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, the Bible says. Holy Spirit leads us into repentance, leads us into the path of righteousness. And so it's, it's so important. Um, but before we welcome the Holy Spirit, I, I want to say one thing very, very quick. Uh, I think the last few weeks, we have not been really sowing enough into the Holy Spirit. So we're just going to take maybe just a short moment. Uh, and I want you to unburden yourself, okay? We're not just here to hear a word, not just here to sing some songs. We're here to be ministered by the Holy Ghost. And we're here to tell Him, Spirit of God, move in us, all right? Are you ready? Would you lift up your hands right now? Tampanese Woodlands and those that are watching online, just lift up your hands. And we're going to welcome the Holy Spirit. Say this with me now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, do a work in me. Do a work in us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Friends, I want to give you a few moments where you can just begin to sow into the Holy Ghost. There are burdens, challenges, heartaches, pains, issues that only God can resolve. And you can sense the tender love of Jesus even here. So begin to unburden yourself to Him. Begin to pray, begin to seek His face. Tell Him, tell Him. Thank you, Jesus. Christ alone Cornerstone To sing it again, begin to pour forth unto the Holy Spirit. Christ. Psalms 88 is going to make sense to some of you. It says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in, so I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim, through sorrow. You know, some of you are going through really sorrowful moments. Every day I call upon you, O oh Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you, in the morning, my prayer comes before you. Oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from a uva, I suffer your terrors. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your deadly assaults destroy me. 
They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. And then when you jump to the next psalm, it proclaims, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. You know, friend, no matter how you are feeling or what you are going through right now, your heavenly Father knows He sent His Son to do the work and now the Holy Spirit still reigns supreme. You are loved, you are treasured, you are graced. And the Lord let His face shine upon you now. Do you not sense His presence? Amen. Come on, lift up your hands right now. Come on, give Him praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Again, one more time. And Christ alone, cornerstone, we may strong is the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Okay, I, I. I sense a word that I'm supposed to say. Please hear it if it responds, if it's something that resonates. Perhaps that's what the Lord is saying to you. If it doesn't, then just let it move on. But I keep seeing the word comfort, comfort, comfort. The Lord's comfort be upon those who are brokenhearted. The Lord's comfort be upon those who feels like a noose is on their neck. The Lord's comfort be upon you. You're not going to find it in a pillow or a bed. You're not going to find it in waters, but you're going to find it in the everlasting love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Comfort, comfort, comfort. The Lord's comfort be upon those who are oppressed. The Lord's comfort be upon those who are triggered. The Lord's comfort be upon those who are down and out. The Lord's comfort be upon those who feel like everything is against you. The Lord's comfort, comfort, comfort be upon you. Receive it now. In Jesus' name. What is the Lord speaking to you? Would you just take a moment before we close ministry time? Perhaps you sense the God wanting to say something to you. Would you, as the Bible says, incline your ear to the Lord and open your heart to what He might reveal? Let's just take a few moments before we get to the Word. Father, speak for your servants are hearing. For your sons and daughters want to beckon to your call and to the word of truth. Lord, may your comfort come. May your comfort come. And for some of you, you're beginning to hear what God is saying. I want you to hold it in and receive it. It's meant for you. And in some time to come, those things that the Lord is beginning to put in, they're going to see the seeds germinate and grow into a plantation. And you're going to see fruits of those things. Father, whatever you are doing, we appreciate you. We love you. Holy Spirit, come and be with us. In Jesus' name and all of us say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's get going. Please be seated. And today I'm excited to share uh, a topic that I, I took some time to really prepare. I had two weeks to really think about this. How to resolve family conflicts. Now, no matter how peaceful your family is, there will surely be some conflicts that come. It's not planned most of the time. Uh, in fact, no one wants conflict, I don't think, right? Like most of us are pretty much peace-loving and if best as possible, we wish there were never a, a situation that causes 
animosity between mom and daughter, father and son, or brother and sister. We would want to avoid it. We want to stop it. We don't want to have it. But yet, you know, in the Church of Christ, I think we have to talk about things that uh, does happen, even if we wish it away. Because when those issues take place and we are unprepared, there are still beautiful biblical nuggets of wisdom that you and I can hold on to and believe that as we practice those things, uh, the Lord is so good to enable us to see breakthrough. Now, on the really positive side of any family conflict is if we can resolve it well and build on what happened, sometimes the relationships become much stronger. You just have to think about some of the friendships you had. Maybe there was a quarrel, and once that was resolved and both are settled, the friendship can actually grow stronger. The same for family conflicts. We don't want a situation, obviously, in the body of Christ where the heated argument leads to a fight that lasts for decades and just breaks up the whole household. Uh, it's not only just the testimony of God in our lives. It's more than that. Obviously, it's, it becomes a very deep pain point. You know, it's been statistically proven that children that go through a divorce uh, parental situation are more likely to go through a divorce themselves. It's statistically proven. Statistically, sorry, not statistically. <laughs> statistically proven. Uh, and the reason is because they kind of see what happened in their parents and they keep believing to some degree. Many children believe that perhaps my parents divorced because of me. It feeds in into their teenage life adult life, and then when they are about to get married, there's a lot of concerns. Oh, oh, what if I get divorced? And things of that nature. And it becomes a scar. There's just one example I can name of many examples that comes through family conflicts that maybe you saw in the previous generation visiting your generation, and now the worst is you are concerned, will it visit the next, right? There's things even in the Christian household that we're talking about at times, generational curses, you know. If someone has diabetes, do we get diabetes? If someone has a propensity for heart failure in the grandparents, does it, does it go down? Cancer, does it, you know, there are all these things. And the beautiful news is that when you start a relationship with Jesus Christ, a new timeline is formed. You're no longer the old man, as the Bible says, or the old woman. You're now made new in the purposes of God. But we're going to talk about a few things that I, I, I pray is going to be helpful. Write this down. The first thing I want you to write down is how do you uh, resolve family conflicts? The first one is adopt a peaceable attitude. You know why things sometimes when a heated situation happens, it never dies down? Because there's always potentially one or two people stoking the flame. <laughs> like, Maybe the argument is about to die down, then all it takes is one party to say, hey, do you know what you did yesterday? And then, you know, more firewood is thrown into the fire, or more oil is poured in, and then it kind of builds up. Now, there's a place and time, obviously, to resolve, but a peaceable attitude does not mean you're running away from the problem. A peaceable attitude is, I want to make sure that at the end of this, we are at peace. The family uh, is at peace. We are resting in the Lord. We are not going to fight and trying to be saying who's right and wrong. I mean, there's a place for that, okay? Uh, there's a place for understanding what is right and wrong, but the end point of peace is to be at peace. And, you know, a simple illustration of our relationship with God is this. If there's anyone in the wrong, it's always us, right? So if God is always right, and we can be in the wrong many times. At the end, though, God wants peace with us, and how he provided it is through his son. So we see Jesus coming, and he broke down the hostility walls of, 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 because of our sin. So God is peace. We are at war with God, and Jesus came. So we are wrong. He's right. But isn't it interesting, the one that is the right 
is the one that's making the way of peace. Isn't it amazing? If you look at God's relationship with us, it wasn't as if we were good people and God was a bad person and then we said, okay, I receive you in my heart. That wasn't the case. It was the total opposite. We were a rebel, we were sinful, still are, right? And he's the one that made a way. The adopting of peace is important. Check out Romans 12, 18. And Paul wrote this. And I want you to know why it's important that Paul wrote this. Because there are many people that believe that Paul the Apostle is very confrontational. After all, he was the one that opposed Cephas to his face. Cephas is another name for Peter. He himself uh, wrote that he opposed Peter for what he did wrong. So we imagine that Paul is this very fiery, very uh, confrontational person, but actually, no, he's fiery but full of love. And look at what he says in Romans 12, 18. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is an awesome posture that we must all adopt. You say, Pastor, what if I want to be peaceful, but the other people don't want to be peaceful? Notice the verse talks about you, not others. The verse says, if it's possible, according to what you can do, live peaceably with others. Now, there are situations where there's no way to repair even a family conflict. And there's going to be breakage in the relationship. But let's not be the one that broke it as a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's be the one that we're trying to repair it. We're trying to reconcile. We're trying to restore it. And you do your part and just entrust the Lord. And here's what some Christians would say. How come I'm always on the losing end? How come I'm the one that's supposed to give and love? And how come my non-Christian brothers and sisters know that? And so I'm the one that lose out. I'm gonna say a statement I hope will help you, then lose out for the glory of God. Because what you're doing is exactly what Jesus did for us. He came to pursue us while we were still sinful, the Bible says. He pursued us. He was giving us peace when we were choosing war at one stage. So you see God toward us. It's the relationship we need to have towards our brothers and sisters, our dads, our moms, our grandparents, or our grandchildren, right? That that should be the way it looks like. Look at what Paul says again. He says, if it's possible. So Paul acknowledges there are situations where there's no way for peace. There's no way for peace. But it should not be because you did not try. It should not be because you did not put effort to be a peacemaker and a bridge builder. You say, Pastor, that sounds like a lot of work. I know. You see, like when it comes to a quarrel, um, it's so much easier in the flesh, right? You say something to me, I say something to you. We fight it out. We score each other some names. Okay, we're done. Relationship severed. It's easy from the standpoint that no work needs to be done to repair it because repairing work is humbling. You say, why is it humbling? Because if you are the one that's trying to make the peace, you know what the impression will be. The other person would assume that you're saying you're wrong. The peacemaker is the one that has to put their neck out there more. You know, it's like, uh, I give it a picture. You know, in all days, you have the medic, they see wounded people on the battlefield and they are healing anyone. It, it doesn't matter whether you are from another country. Uh, if there's a wounded on a battlefield, you know, you are, as a medic, you're going to help heal the person. But you, you must understand, while you're helping, you're still in the line of crossfire. The battle is still going on. You're seeing someone fallen. Oh, okay, you go there and help. Uh, giving you that war medic picture is something similar to a peacemaker you sometimes might be in a line of fire. Now, sometimes the issue that happens in the family has nothing to do with you. You're trying to mediate between two persons in the household. And of course, you can say, but pastor, if I do that, I get, I might be shot by this person and I might be shot there by the other person, right? I, I, I never said it's easy. But consider the beauty of what happens when you are trying to bring peace to the household and you are trying to do what Romans tells us. You're trying to be an ambassador of God's reconciliation. You're trying to show them there's a better way. And you know what's the amazing thing? Many people would agree 
If you go back to the genesis of the family conflict, everyone forgot what the family conflict was about most of the time. It's a small thing that triggered far bigger and then it became more and more added on because more was said and more was done. And more of the ignoring, disrespect, all that takes place. The peaceable attitude is so important. If you say, Pastor, I, I have something in my household that can't be resolved, now it starts with this first point. Will you want to humble yourself to have a peaceable attitude? I understand you lose out. I get you, but there's no other way because that's the spirit that God wants us to adopt, a peaceable attitude. Second point, write this down. Second point. Speak truthfully, oh sorry, uh, be ready to listen without anger. Wow, this is tough, right? So when a family conflict comes, you know how we all are, sometimes we feel frustrated and angry because it's something negative and you're like, oh gosh, I don't want to hear that. But what happens sometimes, you know what happens, right? If, for instance, uh, let's talk about uh, parent and child relationship, right? So let's say I look at my children, and this is what I tell my children all the time. My, me and my wife will tell them, you can share with us anything. But when we said that, you can share with us anything, there's a certain point that we might not want to hear what they share, <laughs> especially if it's something that might trigger us to be angry, right? And the children will know. At a certain point, Rachel and Rainbow will be like, you know, I can't, when you said, Papa, when you said you can share me anything, you don't quite mean it, because if I share this with you, you're going to look like a red monster, you know, <laughs> your whole face is going to be all flushed. So I can't really share with you anything or everything. And, you know, for parents, I, I understand that it's very difficult. But there's a place where the Bible is going to explain to us, if you check out James 1.19, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You know why this is a beautiful remedy of how we can resolve conflicts? Because the opposite of this is where conflicts come. Be what? Be not, be slow to hear, meaning what? When your children are saying something, it might really be important to them. But all we are hearing is, like for instance, your son comes and says, you know, Pa, I just want to tell you, don't get angry, yeah? <laughs> don't get angry. Uh, you know, I was driving your car, and uh, yeah, I took a left turn too fast, you know, and I smashed in the windscreen. What? You know, the anger comes out, right? Like, then you're quick to speak already. Just an example. Like, there's a lot of things that I understand it can trigger our anger, but you know, this verse is fantastic. Be quick to hear. Can you go back? Be quick to hear. Slow to speak, slow to anger. I know we would say, Pastor, I'm too, I'm too fiery for something like this. And maybe that's the reason if we are the opposite of this verse, it's the reason why maybe our children might not want to have a conversation with us on certain things because they know exactly how we're going to respond. Now, again, I know what we're going to say. But Pastor, I happen to be in the right. So shouldn't the person in the right have the right to be angry? No. That's demonic talk. That's how the demons get us to sin. <laughs> right? The demons are telling us, because we have a right, therefore, we can shout, we can scream, we can be angry, we can bang table. That's what demons talk. Uh, God talk is not that way. God talk is Jesus at the cross. God talk is humbling himself. God talk is totally different. So look at the verse again. I, I'm, I'm wondering whether you can see what James is saying. If we are quick to hear, what happens? We are ready to try to understand. It doesn't mean we agree, okay? It doesn't mean we agree that our son should just crash the car, right? I, I, I'm not talking about agreement. We're saying that there's a space that you're saying, okay, I'm going to hear, even though I don't really want to hear, but I want to let my son, my daughter, my dad, my mom, feel valued that I'm going to hear them out. See, in every conflict that happens, let's say I'm, I'm a pastor trying to meet the two of you, two sides of the story, right? So one side of the story share, Pastor pays up, blah, 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 blah. Second side of the story share, Pastor pays up, blah, 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 blah. And I'll be like, wow. 
Many times in conflicts, you can ask the pastors in this church, both sides will have some level of wrong. You might be the initiator of the wrong, and then the second party continues the wrong. Or you might be the one that the wrong was done to, and then you continue to push back the wrong. Either way, there's a lot of situations that happens in husband and wife relationships that happen. Husband did something wrong, wife fights back, vice versa. Right? It becomes very convoluted. If you ask a pastor, how do you resolve it? It's not easy. Finally, it becomes, okay, uh, both of you have to learn to communicate. Now, here's the thing. You say, pastor, I know communication is the key. So I communicate, my son here, Lord. <laughs> Wait. Communication is two-way, though. And if we adopt a mindset that I'm the only one going to speak, then obviously there's no way for conflict resolution. Because that means that you're not going to be hearing where your family member, uh, where they really are. See, and one, one of the things that's tricky is that because all of us are created differently, so we have different wants and needs and also different perspective on things. And so I know sometimes you would say, you know, wow, Pastor, if you know how my daughter thinks, uh, my daughter really thinks very weird. Maybe. But she's given to you by God. She's a gift, a heritage, the Bible says, from the Lord to you. And she thinks very different. Maybe if you could see on the bright side, she has a unique way of looking at things. Then how do you come alongside with her to shape some of those thinking? But if you are going to be quick to shut it off, uh, conflicts are going to arise. You know what's the conversation that will go the other side? My papa don't understand me. Are you sure? Yes. He doesn't even give me a chance to speak. And you say, no, pastor, no, I give my daughter a chance to speak. But when she speaks stupid, I scold. So that's the problem, right? So that's why this whole phrase is important. Be quick to hear. Okay, daughter, share. Be slow to speak. I know you want to say something. Calm down. Don't say anything yet. Because you know what's going to trigger the person. And you know what the person might be doing is triggering you. I get that. But if you really want to resolve family conflict, sometimes it's not about right and wrong anymore. Sometimes it's about humbling yourself. So when we are quick to hear, slow to speak, that's humbling yourself. Honest truth, that is humbling yourself. You're not trying to fight your rights. You're trying to win back your daughter, win back your son. And for some of you, you need to hear this, okay? You can go for a hundred pastoral counselling, but if you're unwilling to humble yourself, no pastor is such a good magician or a counsellor to, to solve it. It's not going to work. Because that pastor can talk to your daughter and make your daughter see God's love, but you still have to show God's love. Because when it's all said and done, the pastor is not your daughter's father. Quick to hear. Okay, share me, share me, girl. What, what's slow to speak? Oh, Lord, you need to. I be done already, oh, Lord. I want to say something right now. Oh, I know what she said, oh, but if I say now, I'm going to alienate her for the rest of her life. And slow to anger. That's another part of it, right? You know, sometimes anger builds, right? Because the more you say it, the more ooh, the anger grows. One simple tip based on James 1.19 is really pray in the spirit when you're hearing those conversations. And sometimes I do that as well because I know I'm going to be in potentially a heated argument it sometimes has happened in my life, and I'm like, God, you know, if you don't hold my tongue, I'm going to unleash things that I would very, very much regret later on. You know, there's this statement in Chinese, Dong si kai luan si, hua bu kai luan jiang, right? <laughs> it's so true, man. You eat something, you stomach ache three days out, you know, but you say something wrong, you might be three years out, man. Like, you, the relationship will never be the same again. Right? There's some things you can't say. And you hold it back and you say, Father, I, what I want to say is true, but it's too painful. And it's going to be taken like I'm attacking that person. But I love my family member. I love my daughter. I love my son. I, and I don't want to put undue stress of my own expectations on them. So let's... Look at James 1.19. Just one more time. Look at this. It says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person, not just one person, all of us, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. 
not possible by our own strength. Pray. Father, I need help, please. Right? But trust me, friends, if you are really able to do James 1.19, I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you, you have a wonderful relationship. I know one person personally. He's, he's an uncle uh, from my wife's side. I know him personally. He stays in Australia. He would be exactly a James 1.19. That's why his children, he has three children. They all love him. We, we check with the children. They all love him. Why? Because he's willing to hear. Share, share, just share. He's slow to respond in a negative way. He gives them space to talk. But pastor, you cannot say like that, no pastor. Because I'm the kind, uh, when I go into the room, uh, I'm the machine gun. You know, bah, 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 bah. Everyone keep quiet. I don't know why everyone coward. Uh, everyone timid. I'm the one that talk a lot. Uh. But you see, I also got character. I got X factor I should be in. Humble yourself. You should be in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. But humble yourself. Okay, we, we, that, 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 that causes more and more tension. Trust me, right? The conflicts will never end because it's always going to be a fight. It's always going to be a fight. So this one requires some prayer. You say, Pastor, that relationship that is failing in my household is important to me. Okay, James 1.19, honest truth. Take it to the Lord, ask the Spirit for help, and then call for that meeting with the person that has an issue with you or vice versa, and be slow to anger, be slow to speak, be quick to listen. Okay, I want to hear you, I want to hear you, I want to hear you, okay? This is humbling yourself. I, I'll be honest, it's humbling yourself, it's not easy, but it will go a long way to rebuilding any potential severed relationships. Point C, write this down. Now, it's not just the humbling part. Point C is important. Speak truthfully and wisely. Here's what happens also. There's a swing side of peace that is not helpful. What's the swing side, Pastor? The swing side is you want to create peace. So it means that every wrong that was done, we sweep it under the carpet. Now, that doesn't build long-term relationships. Right, please, I don't want you to not be holistic. I want to help you see a well-rounded way of seeing it. I include this point prayerfully for you is because I want you to realize that at times you might be doing all you can, right? You might be literally doing Adopting a peaceable attitude, that's point number one. You might be ready to listen without anger, point number two. You might be really doing your part. And the other person is unwilling to meet you somewhere in the middle. The person is unwilling to humble themselves. At a certain point, I'll be frank, may not be easy to really restore that family relationship because then things that are wrong keeps perpetuating. So look at the verse in Proverbs 10, 9. Check it out. It says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. Now, these are for more serious situations. Like, there are situations in the household sometimes that are not just petty differences and arguments. It could be serious. And that's why the Bible has different places for different things. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of advice. Right? So you try your best to humble yourself, be peaceable, to reconcile, but not always is possible in your case. As already Paul said in Romans 12, 18, if all be possible, if it's all up to you, live peaceably with everyone. But look at what it says here. If you walk in the integrity, you walk securely, but one who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Let's go into a Bible story that I think we all remember. Remember Jacob trying to cheat his brother uh, Esau? That relationship, in a real sense, was doomed to fail. So Esau was supposed to have the birthright. Jacob saw Esau's birthright and was saying, I need to have it. How am I going to steal it from him? The, the worst part is that the mom loves him so much that the mom was just as crooked as he was. The mom was trying to plot for him. Okay, you're going to dress up like your brother. You're going to feel as hairy as your brother. You're going to trick your father because your father is a bit blind, blind as a bat, so let's trick him out. It's crazy. Like this kind of relationship, it, frankly, it becomes a bit toxic. There's some situations that's very difficult. And in that case, it's very hard. Like there's no counselor that would say, uh, okay, Jacob, Esau, come together. And uh, Jacob, are you going to stop cheating your brother? No. Uh, Esau, are you going to stop trying to kill your brother? No. Okay. Uh, please, please move out. <laughs> you, know? you can't do much because both sides at that point would not be able to meet. Jacob want to, uh, Esau want to kill Jacob, Jacob want to cheat the brother. This is, this is a match made in hell, right? Like, it's not going to work out. 
So literally in the story in Genesis, we see Jacob running away. He ran as far as he could to Uncle Laban because he can't stay at home. The, the brother is a hunter and will literally massacre him. So he has to be on the run. Now, that kind of a relationship, no pastoral care would help at that point, right? Because they're not ready. It took literally years and years after that whole saga. Then we see actually Jacob making the trip back and mending ties with Esau. At that point, we see there was a mending of ties between the two brothers, but it took years. But the point still remains, right? If you look at this, uh, Jacob really fits the second part. But he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. So Jacob was trying to cheat the brother and cheat the father, and was he found out? Yep. Later on, at Uncle Laban's house, he did the same. He cheated Uncle Laban of, 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 of some of the sheep. He did the same. He was found out. Right? So at that point, he was still living a very crooked life. Jacob was not a good man. If you think he is, he's not. Only when he met God at Penel, and then his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, now, that was a turning point in his life. That was when he was truly a follower of God. But prior to that, he's a crook. You will not want to leave Jacob with one dollar, right? Like, you're not going to stay there with him and say, uh, hey, Jacob, you know, I need to go to the toilet, right? Uh, can you take care of my sheep for a minute? Sure, sure, brother, sure, sure. By the time you come back from the toilet, maybe your whole caravan left. <laughs> he really drove off. He took your camel as well. Everything he took, man. Jacob is not a good man at that point. And I, when I see Proverbs 10, 9, totally reminds me of Jacob. Like, he's a crooked man before meeting God at Penel. That's when his life was, was radically changed. Now, some of you, you're in a family situation where we call ourselves all Christian, so to speak, but not necessarily everyone is committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. So the casual name of Christian might not really make a big deal when it comes to actual living out. How do we know? Look at Jacob's household. Esau was a murderer. The Bible says he was an immoral man. Jacob was a thief. So, and coming from Isaac, Isaac was a good man, righteous man. But the righteous father at that point did not produce two righteous sons. You had two unrighteous sons living under the banner of a so-called godly household, but they were not really godly. And here's where the complications arise, folks. Sometimes we want to resolve family conflicts, but not everyone is on the same page. Guys, let's use the Bible. Family, let's use the Word of God as the way to kind of mediate. And so what ends up happening is, it's, it's quite tough. You might be willing to, someone else might not be willing to. But why I want you to see this verse is this though. Why do we have to be speaking in truth and at, at the same time be really wise? Because while you're walking in integrity, you're walking securely before God, but you need to realize there are others that might not be doing the same. And that means that they're gonna live life very different to what their flesh dictates. If they're not walking in the spirit, the Bible says, they're walking in flesh. That's what the Bible says. So Jacob and Esau happened in their situation. You know why there's no way to resolve? Because both were wicked. Both were crooked at that point. Later on, Jacob was changed and humbled himself and went back to apologize and make things right. In fact, he brought a caravan full of precious possessions. He brought cattle to kind of pay back and to give his brother Esau to kind of say, I'm, I'm sorry for what I did wrong and I hope that I can compensate to some degree of all the hurts I, I, I placed on you. Now, there's no indication, friends, that Esau became saved. In fact, by all accounts, based on scripture, Jacob become Israel, he's the redeemed, and Esau is the rejected. Which means that at the end of that so-called godly household of Isaac, Jacob is with God, Esau is not. Now you say, Pastor, if Esau is not, then if I'm Jacob, why should I make amends? Because it is about you living for God, not you living for others. If you live for others, you can choose who to hate. If you live for the Lord, you're, you're not making a choice anymore. You are saying, what do you want me to do, God? What would be most pleasing in your sight? What can I do in this life that really honors you? And that's why the humbling process for Christians is amazing. And some of you have to go through really humbling situations to make the family work. Because you are the one that says, I'm willing. I'm willing to humble myself and I want to bring hands together. I want to be a bridge builder. 
Point D, two more, right? Then we'll close. Uh, point D, be willing to receive or give correction. Now, a part of conflict resolution honestly comes with the part where we have to say, how do we make right? How do we make amends? How do we make sure that this closes up nicely? And when there's harm being done, like for instance, Jacob harmed Esau. And so Jacob came back and humbled himself to apologize. He's making amends. He's willing to be corrected, right? But the reason why I put this point is not just you being willing to give correction to others. Sometimes in a conflict, we are at fault. We have to be also willing to receive correction. That's not easy. Now, it says in Ecclesiastes 7.5, it says, it is better for men to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. I love this verse. You know why? Think about it. Any of us prefer to hear scolding or a wonderful, beautiful melody, a song. And yet, Ecclesiastes, who we know to be Solomon, wrote this. Solomon wrote to us and said, you know what? It is better that you hear the rebuke, which means scolding, of a wise person than to hear a song. It's beautiful in sound, but it's foolish. It's sung from the mouth of fools. You say, Pastor, this is really something else. Yep, this, is, this verse is not for each ears. See, each year wants the song of fools. And we don't have to look far. We just have to look at all the kind of songs that the world has pushed out. And the world has been corrupted by demons many times. And so the songs we hear in the airwaves, many songs are really propagated by demonic influences. Now the songs are no longer simply sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was like in the 80s, man. Now we have more further, we have evolved to the point, it's crazy, we're talking about non-binary, we're talking like songs that is on just crime plus more, uh, sadistic things plus more. The world has shifted. Right? Even the songs is no longer the same. If we think that the songs in the past, the Bee Gees and Elvis, some of the songs were really not so good in terms of the morals, now, my gosh, what morals? Uh, songs, if you don't just hear the, uh, the, the melody, if you Google the lyrics, you'll be very surprised at how many songs are teaching a lot of filthy, disgusting things. Very gross. So gross that it's, it's unbelievable that it can be allowed on the airwaves. But this is the time we're living in, folks. We're really living in the end days, and this is happening. But those are songs of fools. But here's the thing, though. The melody is nice. And sometimes we might be in a shopping mall and we hear the melody and we begin to jive to it. And then you Google the words and say, what? What is this words? Oh, no. Would you rather listen to a beautiful song that is sung by fools or a scolding that is said by a wise man? And the truth is our flesh would choose song. Because who wants to be scolded? I don't want to be scolded. When I came here on Sunday, the first thought is I don't want to be scolded, right? That's not what I want to hear, Right? I don't want that. But there's a place for rebuke. And I want you to hear a moment why this is important. In Hebrews, it says, for those that the Lord loves, he will chasten, he will discipline, he will scourge, which means that sometimes God has to correct us so that we don't go off kilt, off path, off the ways of righteousness. He wants us back on the right path. And sometimes he has to do that like he did for King David. He has to correct us and there's rebuke that comes. The rebuke is not intent to destroy. The rebuke is meant to lead us to wake up, to go back to what is necessary. Right? If your Christian life is like driving or walking, you don't want to walk off the cliff. You don't want to drive off the mountain. So he needs to lead us back. The rebuke sounds harsh. Like for instance, if I'm driving and I'm sleepy, let's say I'm driving on Great Ocean Road, right? We did that one time long ago, myself and my wife. So we did that. Let's say I'm sleepy. And my wife said, baby, wake up. Don't shout at me, woman. Ah! <laughs> Which is worse? Getting a bit of scolding when necessary or being flung out and destroyed? You, I, I hope you see the point because I don't want to say scolding is awesome. I want to say no one likes to be scolded. But I'm, I'm telling you that rebuke from the Lord at times 
can save our lives. The same way that if you are sleepy, you are about to drive off, and your wife says, baby, wake up! Ah! Ayo! Okay, okay, sorry. Ah. Where's my Red Bull, baby? <laughs> Sometimes when I drive a long distance, I usually try to get Coke or something. I'm not promoting Coke, okay? I don't get paid, but I'm just saying. You know, I need something to wake me up, so coffee or Red Bull. Red Bull really is good. It just kick you, in a, you know, just punch you out like, okay, Red Bull, thank you. Wow, okay. Okay, I'm on track. But when we receive rebuke, though, we don't like it, I understand. But we need to be ready to receive at times. You see, if, if God doesn't have the right to rebuke us, who, who, who has? If we don't give space where God can literally say something that we don't want to hear, don't like to hear, but got to hear, then actually we give zero authority to anyone to be able to challenge us. Can I, can I ask you a question? When we say, God is the one that's molding me. You know what the picture of molding is? Remember the picture of the potter and the clay? So let's say you are the clay, I'm the clay. When the potter wants to mold the clay, what does he have to do? He has to move you, right? And moving you, is it painful? Yes. Because sometimes if he wants to mold us to something useful, he has to say, turn left, turn right, stop what you're doing, go forward, serve, give... And we are saying, no! How does he mow if we say no? So sometimes he has to scold so that we wake up, then he can mow. I, I, I need you to see that picture. And the same, like our children grew up, we have to admit, okay, those of you that have parents, all of us have parents, right? That's why we're here. Right? You're not born by an alien, but okay. So all of you have parents. Do you remember your parents quoting you? No one likes it, Okay. Please, right? If you like it, you need serious counseling. Pastor, wow, I tell you, very touch shock, you know. What well, today, uh, I ate all the best food, uh, but not shock, no, until my papa scold me. When my papa scold me, I felt so happy. You are sadist, right? But that's not you, I know. And no one is like that. But what I mean is, if you consider what your parents scolded you about, leave out the parts they were wrong. Leave out the parts maybe they overdid it. And most of the time, their scolding was out of a good intent. You cannot deny. You can't deny. Most of the time. Okay, most of the time. Right, unless your parents are serial killers, most of the time, okay? Your parents scolded you for a good reason. And, you know, if you took some of the lessons your parents said that was good to heart, it shaped you to be an upstanding citizen. It just did. So, the same with Father God. We need to give that space for Him to rebuke us, then he can mold us and shape us. You say, what happens if I'm a clay that cannot be molded properly? This is what happens, okay? If the Lord wants to make you a jug, a jug is to fill with water, right? A pitcher or a jug, all right? And let's say he can't mold certain parts. What happens is he pours the water in, the water goes out because there's a big hole. And that could be the reason why some of you are saying, Pastor, I sense the Lord's presence but it seems like I'm, water is flowing out. You know why? You, you might not be willing to hear a sudden rebuke of God so that He can close that area where things are gushing out. Instead of keeping in what God wants, now it's beginning to pour out. It's what the Bible says, to those who hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So it's not like you hear and then it flows out. Rather, you hear what God says and it goes in. And when it goes in, something comes alive. Some of you are so successful in your workplace, you heard a talk, a statement by a guru, you heard it and you say, wow, that statement is a trillion dollar statement. You heard it, it went in. Okay, great. Hear God speak and let it come in, go in, keep it in. But if he can't mold you, it goes out. Best picture I can give you. Last point, and we're close. Reconciliation and restoration is the goal. You say, Pastor, I have some fractured relationships in my household. I really don't know what to do. And I tell you honestly, I love that you're asking the pastors to help because that's what we want to do. So I'm not making light. There's a pastoral council that helps. But what I'm saying is pastoral council is not the end point. It's like going to the doctor, you know, but your doctor can live your life or live my life for us. The doctor can prescribe and help and diagnose and give suggestions, but ultimately, we have to take the steps. 
It's the same. The pastoral counsel can only do so much. But finally, we're not married to your wife. Uh, we're not fathers to your children or your grandchildren. There's limitations on what we can do. We can help certain parts where maybe it's difficult without a third party. But ultimately, if you can see that, yes, the Lord puts in counselors and wise men and women and cell leaders and pastors and all that to help, awesome. But the help only goes to a certain point. And then we have to see how do we harness it? Though? How do we build it? So if you see restoration and reconciliation as really the key to the relationship, then you are looking at the end point as not winning the argument, losing the war, losing your son or daughter, or losing your father or mother, but winning the person over. To God, obviously, hopefully, but at the same time, winning the person over. Righting the wrong, cancelling the debt, forgiving the transgressions, making the path straight again. And again, things of the nature, how, 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 pastor? Be slow to speak, slow to angry, quick to hear. You know, if you just do that, it starts somewhere. You know, this is the number one thing that happens in arguments. Everyone knows this statement, right? Hey, bro, uh, bro, why you never sort out your issue with your mother? What would the guy say? What's the point? Mommy is always the same. She will never listen. Now, I, I understand that once you humble yourself and begin to listen, you still have doubts from your son. Your son will be like, Mommy, you won't listen. Nah. No, boy, I'm listening. No, you won't listen. Nah. No, nah, I'm hearing. Nah. No, you won't listen. I, I read. I'm, I'm ready. Nah. Talk. Nah. He might not, uh, first two tries might not work. I'm listening. Hey, mom, you're there or not? Yeah, I'm listening. You never talk for 10 minutes. I, I let you talk, uh, boy. You talk, uh. you talk. You talk, you talk. I'm listening. You zoom, I also look and smile. I'm listening. The uh, first two times will be still hard because they are going by what you used to be. My dad will never listen. Uh. Oh, yeah, my son, uh, pastor, will never listen. I get you. I get you. So change must happen somewhere. And once you make some of those changes, you'll be amazed that how much the other person, out of their anguish and hurt, responded in a, in a bad way. Right? And some of you are saying, Pastor, does my daughter love me or not? Does my son? They love you, but they can't stand to be around you. Truth. I'm telling you the truth, man. If you want to meet me for counseling, don't bother. I'm just telling you right now. Some of your sons and daughters, they love you, but they want to love you, but not hear you talk all the time. They want to have space to share. Truth. Truth. I just saved you $1,000 of therapy, man. Just, just like that. Truth. So he said, Pastor, I'll try. Try today. Pastor, my son wants to pick up my call. Eh? <laughs> Stand him Zoom link. Ah. <laughs> son, son, you, you, you come and show, up. show your face on Zoom. Help me. Ah. Son, I don't know how to do Zoom. Ah. Zoom, Zoom. Okay. Mama, you haven't moved for 10 minutes. You okay or not? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm listening. <laughs> you try that. Okay, last point. Galatians uh, 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Uh, Galatians 6, one, next one. Should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. Now, this verse is applicable to all types. It can be from leader to member, pastor to, to uh, you know, clergy to congregation, uh, any sorts of relationship, including, of course, the family relationship. You know why? Because sometimes, like using Jacob's example, he did wrong. They can't just sweep over the carpet. Like, you know, it can't be like he came home and Isaac and Esau said, okay, we're glad you're home, uh, Jacob, but don't mind us. Uh, uh, we're going to lock up the whole house. So every time Jacob goes in, hey, how come uh, I on the TV cannot on? Uh? Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, I need password. <laughs> Everything password protected from Jacob because Jacob's gonna steal, right? So like the whole house is like they can't live with him because they're like, okay, you're gonna steal from us. So something still gotta be resolved. And this verse is about how do you reconcile? So it says, if there's someone who did wrong, transgression is sin and wrong, right? You who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Now notice the words here, gentleness. It's very important. You're not there to scold and beat and, and all that. You're there to say, okay, wrong was done. We don't want to say it didn't happen. Jacob, you did steal. But there's love and grace. And we want to bring you back to the household. 
But honestly, Jacob, if let's say I'm Isaac, honestly, I'm not sure when Esau might scream uh, that all his hunting gear disappeared. Uh. You saw on eBay, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> like if I'm Isaac, I'll be like, I don't know, man. Like, is it better you come home or you just stay out? Because if you come home, the whole family equilibrium, we're all freaking out. If you go out, we know nothing is going to be stolen, right? We hope nothing is going to be stolen. So this picture is Isaac going to Jacob. But that didn't happen in the story. But if we could reimagine that Isaac, Jacob, Esau story, that would have been wonderful if Isaac could have told Esau, Jacob did wrong. We're going to resolve it. I'm the father. I will make it work. He did wrong. He has to do his part. Reach out to Uncle Laban, who is housing uh, Jacob. Said, you know, I got to speak to my son, right? Then uh, Israel Zoom, <laughs> whatever it is. Then uh, Jacob come back home. We're going to resolve it. Now, Jacob, you did wrong, Galatians 6 1. But I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to restore you. Now, here's the part where things can go wrong or right. Papa, I don't need to be restored. I did not do anything wrong. Stealing is the way of life. You can't, you can't go further. See, I hope that helps you because there are some of you that is, we tend to go extreme. We tend to go too hard. And you did wrong, our son. Papa, that was 20 years ago. I thought you forgave me already. Yala, I just want you to remember you did wrong. You remember or not? You remember or not? You remember or not? Hey, today my birthday, you wish me one time, you remember or not? That's too far. Then the other side is, it doesn't matter. Oh, you know, like Esau come home and Isaac come home and the whole house is disappeared. Yeah, you know, it's okay. We're we'll reconciled with Jacob. Everything is fine. We have no house to live, man. <laughs> Everything is okay. See, that doesn't work. The extreme doesn't work. Extreme grace doesn't work. Extreme law doesn't work. One is way too licentious. One is way too legalistic. We need that balance. And you say, how to balance, Pastor? You don't look at me, look at Galatians 6.1. Look at Galatians 6.1. Someone is caught in a transgression. Jacob, you did wrong. I'm your father, Isaac. I'm supposed to lead this household. I want to be spiritual. Okay, how do I restore you to me, to your brother? You did wrong. Let's address that. But I don't want to attack you and give you no space for grace. Now, the last part, it says, keep watch on yourself, lest you to be tempted. This has a lot of meaning. What is the temptation? When you're trying to resolve the situation, you get licentious, like I say, or too legalistic. Friend, I'm going to be very candid. We're going to make mistakes in trying to reconcile sons and daughters and, and husbands. It's, it's going to be messy. Um, if relationships are not messy, uh, I mean, relationships are always messy at times. We, we all acknowledge that. But it's worth it. I want to paint your last picture and then we'll pray. Is that okay? What did it take God to restore a messy relationship he had with us? We know the, the picture already, but if you see the whole flow of it, it's pretty amazing, actually. The Bible 66 books chronicles the history of mankind under the banner of his story, God's story, and how he, despite creating the universe, has set a special love on his creation, mankind. And how to redeem us, you see the lengths that God used to redeem us through Genesis to Revelation, like just read it. It blows our minds. If we take a step back from our own history to God's his story, we would start to see, this is amazing, that God would actually pay attention to an ant, to a worm, like what Jacob said, to, to a nobody like me, to someone small and insignificant and obscure. He would pay attention to me. Like, how is that possible? And we see how God, even though the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray, each of us turning our own separate ways, then God humbles himself and says, I'm the good shepherd. You say, Pastor, I never saw it this way before. Yeah, the king of the universe says he's a lowly shepherd. He humbles himself as the king of the universe and describes himself as a shepherd. I want you to try to talk to the greatest billionaires in this world and ask them, 
do you call yourself CEO or shepherd or servant? Only God can do that. God has that ability to be so humble toward us whom He made and willing to step into our history despite His story being so grand. He stepped into our mediocre, terrible, sinful plight, saved us through His shedding of His blood. And we have the guts to tell Him, Pastor, I mean, God, the relationship, wow, I... I really send the text message, I humble myself. That's all I can do. Are are we sure? We can go a bit more though. I'm not scolding you, I'm just saying in love. We can go a bit more, right? Pastor, I really send all this text, my son no reply, how? Keep sending. Keep sending. Uh, The picture of God pursuing you, He pursued you when you were young. You said no. Pastor, when I was young, I was not a Christian. The first time you really set your eyes on a beautiful sunset and begin a puzzle about the cosmic and the universe, it set you a gaze to the beauty of God, even if you don't want to name it as God. And then you grew up, you found love and friendships, and you say, there's something beautiful here. It's the picture of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in union. And then finally, in your wretchedness, you saw the cross, and the Lord showed you His grace and love and drew you in. And you see the picture, it never ends though. And then at times in our waking moments, we are forgetting God. At times we ignore God, even as Christians. At times we have our Bibles always closed. We refuse to pray except emergency. We come to church when we like or don't like. Now here it is, I'm not blaming, I'm just saying, despite all that, you see a loving God that woos us again and again, that draws us by His loving kindness again. And again, if we think that our son don't reply a few texts is so cruel, how have we been cruel to a God that we have ignored for so much of our lives? You say, Pastor, you're making me feel bad. You're seeing it wrong. You're supposed to see the glory and the love of God that changes us so that we are saying, Lord, I've ignored you for so long. I can humble myself. If my dad, my mom, my son, my daughter ignore me for a while, I'm going to humble myself. I'm not going to make this a big deal. Like, I'm the papa, he should... No, I'm not going to make this a big deal. Son, are you there? Son, I got to talk to you. Daughter, I got to talk to you. I know that the relationship is fractured, but I got to talk to you. Can papa, I'm willing to listen now. Or maybe you're a son and daughter. You said, dad, I'm so sorry. I've not been listening. I'm ready to hear now. Right? Come back together. Have a family meal. Begin to talk. See these five points come to play. And you know what? May God restore our homes. May God unite our hearts. May God bring back fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and brothers and sisters. And may we all see the fruition of restoration in this lifetime in our homes. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? If you have a family conflict, I want you to close your eyes right now. And the rest of us, if we could just be in a prayerful moment, I just want to pray for you as we come to a close. Some of you say, Pastor, there's so much conflict in my home. I have no idea what to do. And brother, sister, today's sermon is just a start. You can take the sermon as seeds. Hopefully it goes into a plantation. Go back, hear the sermon again and again and say, God, give me the strength. Friend, it starts with humbling ourselves, really. It does start there. Before you want to restore anything, especially as messy as a fractured relationship. It starts with humbling ourselves. Would you mind if I pray with you on that? I hope you don't get offended, but honest truth, if you say, Pastor, I need help, then humbling ourselves is the only way. Humble ourselves at the mighty hand of God and He will make our path straight. Let's pray. Father, there are sons and daughters or dads or moms or grandparents or even grandchildren where maybe there are relationship strains And it surprises us at times, oh God, how it happened. It happened months ago, years ago, and now it's it's getting worse. Oh God, some of us thought that it was just a small tear in the clothes, but now it seems like it's ripping our hearts apart. It's ripping out the fabric of the home. Lord, we pray for that strange relationship, that son, that daughter, maybe the father, the mother. Lord, somehow, Lord, draw us back. Draw the situation back. Oh God, you can repair Lord, it took a long time, but finally Jacob and Esau were restored. It can be done. Oh God, it can be done. It can be done. 
So Father, we ask right now, we plead before you, first and foremost, humble our hearts. Lord, if some of us know it's so difficult, it's really difficult for our children to talk to us because no matter what it is, maybe we hold on to a very strong, I'm the papa, I'm the mama, and that's it. Or perhaps, Lord, it's just that we were stubborn to hear. Lord, whatever it is, oh God, will you humble us so that we're willing for the sake of relationship, for the sake of your love. We're willing to humble ourselves. Oh God, it starts there. We receive that right now. Second prayer. Father, there are things that wrong was done to us. Oh God. It's not just what we did, oh God. We acknowledge our fault and we need to humble ourselves. But at the same time, Lord, some words were done, some disrespect happened, some arguments that were so large and we don't know how to sort it out, oh God. And for some of us, it still hurts very bad. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm going to pray for your healing right now. Receive that healing right now. Brother, sister, if you have been hurt by your family member so deep, it feels worse because you are saying, God, if my enemies can cut me deep, it's worse to receive a wound from my family member who I never thought could hurt me. And I want you to hear the Holy Father to show you the wounds that he has. I want you to see Jesus' wounds on his back. I want you to see Jesus' nail pierced hands and feet. I want you to see what Jesus endured. And right now, I'm praying for your healing. By the stripes, okay, for those of you friends, Tampanese Woodlands Overflow, if you say, Lord, I need healing of those family wounds, would you just take a moment, lift up your hands right now, and I want to say this now, and I believe it in Jesus' name, okay? By the stripes of Jesus Christ, any one of us that have been hurt in familial relationships, in Jesus' precious name, you are set free. I say it again, you are set free. That pain is gone, that yoke of slavery is lifted. You're a new person in Jesus. You're a new woman. Now you are graced by the love of God, afresh to start afresh. In Jesus' name, would you say a good amen? Amen, amen. Now give the Lord praise. One final prayer, one final prayer. And I, 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 I need you to just join hands. Could you just join hands? Don't worry about COVID, it's okay. Just, just join hands quickly, all right? Just join hands with the person next to you. Now, this is a family of God and we're gonna pray together for a minute. I'm gonna say a statement and I need us to just agree and shout out to the Lord, amen. Once I'm done with the prayer, you just shout out amen and we clap our hands and treat it as the Lord is uniting our families together, okay? Listen close. By the power of the Holy Spirit, under the ordination of your word, O oh God, we want to declare only by the blood of Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost that every single family that is part of Lighthouse Evangelism will be restored. Relationships will be reconciled. Hurts will be gone. And Lord, you are just strengthening the family in Jesus' name. And all of us say, Amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Amen. And Christ alone, cornerstone, we may strong in the same. Sing one more time, Christ alone.